Kayla Campos was born to parents Carl and Gayla Campos. In 2019, 21-year-old Kayla was living in New Mexico and aspired to be a dental hygienist. Just before midnight on October 18, 2019, Kayla and her boyfriend, Sydney, were playing Pokemon Go at Bianchetti Park near her apartment in Albuquerque. This was a daily routine for them, but unfortunately, this night would be different and would end in tragedy. As they were driving, they came upon three teenagers being robbed at gunpoint by two men in the middle of Granite Avenue. In a panic, Kayla quickly turned her car around to leave when one of the suspects began chasing her car and opened fire with an assault rifle. One of the bullets struck Kayla in the head and caused her to crash into a nearby home. She was rushed to the University of New Mexico Hospital, where she was sadly pronounced dead. It turns out the shooter, 19-year-old Isaiah Garcia, believed that the car Kayla and her boyfriend were in was owned by a member of a rival gang named Christian Maddock. A few weeks before Garcia murdered Kayla, he murdered 17-year-old Sean Markey. Just like in Kayla's case, he said Sean was not the intended target. Sean was attending a homecoming party when things got out of control after some individuals showed up uninvited. Those individuals began pulling out their guns to show them off, at which point everyone was asked to leave. One of those individuals was Garcia, who allegedly came to the party to seek revenge on another teen. Once everyone was asked to leave, Sean and his friend were left to wait for their ride home. That's when Garcia opened fire and a bullet ricocheted and struck Sean. He was rushed to the hospital but sadly didn't survive. In August of 2021, Garcia was found guilty of Sean's murder and sentenced to life in prison. A few months earlier, in April of 2021, while he was in jail awaiting trial, he stabbed a fellow inmate multiple times. Garcia claimed the stabbing was revenge for the death of his half-brother. For that charge, he took a plea deal. As for Kayla's murder, Garcia was charged with eight crimes that included first-degree murder, shooting at a motor vehicle, armed robbery, assault with intent to commit a violent felony, tampering with evidence, child abuse, and conspiracy in connection with Kayla's murder. On February 29, 2024, he was found guilty of all charges. He has yet to be sentenced, but is facing another life term in prison. Justin McLean Bloxham was born on May 29, 1997, in Shreveport, Louisiana, to Amy and Kevin. In 2010, 12-year-old Justin was an honors student at North DeSoto Middle School and was said to enjoy playing football for the Griffins football team, skateboarding, karate, and playing the drums. He was also good at science and won first place at a science fair. On top of that, he was a member of the 4-H club and enjoyed helping on his grandfather's farm. On March 30, 2010, Justin was staying at a friend's home in Stonewall, Louisiana, when he began receiving texts from a person he assumed was a 14-year-old girl. During the text, the girl was trying to convince him to sneak out of the house so the two could meet and have sex. She even offered to send over a taxi. After some convincing, Justin finally agreed, and at 3 a.m., he snuck out of the friend's home and climbed into the taxi. Unbeknownst to Justin, the girl was actually a sex offender by the name of Brian Douglas Horn, who was driving the taxi. After getting in the car, he was never seen alive again. It turns out that Horn's stepdaughter was a friend of Lauren Lindsay's, who was also friends with Justin. Horn had asked to borrow Lauren's phone to get ringtones off of it, but instead, he was secretly getting Justin's phone number. When Justin's friend's family woke up later that morning and realized Justin was gone, they reported him missing. When law enforcement arrived, they began questioning neighbors and learned that a green action taxi cab was seen at the house. When a deputy with the department learned they were looking for a green taxi, he informed investigators that he saw one parked on the side of U.S. Highway 171 last night and stopped to investigate. The officer said that Horn told him that he had run out of gas and lost his key and that someone from the taxi company was bringing him another one. Other witnesses had also seen him and stopped to ask if he needed help and were also told the same story. 
Investigators went and searched the woods in the area where Horn's taxi was last seen and sadly found Justin's body in a shallow pool of water about 30 to 40 yards from the highway. The key to the taxi was also found in the same area. It was most likely dropped during the assault and murder. As for Justin's cause of death, the medical examiner determined he had been ultimately smothered to death. When Horn's brother, Kevin, learned that his brother was a person of interest in Justin's murder, he followed him to the action taxi to return the car and then drove him to the police station. On April 12, 2010, Horn was indicted by a grand jury for first-degree murder and aggravated kidnapping. A jury then found him guilty and sentenced him to death. However, in September 2018, the sentence was vacated by the Louisiana Supreme Court because of a ruling in another capital murder case where the defendant's attorney conceded their guilt before the jurors. In 2023, a new trial took place and ended the same as the first, with him being found guilty and sentenced to death. In 1972, 59-year-old Nellie N. Hicks was living in Newark, California and working as a fourth grade teacher at Ashland School. She was a single mother to six children after leaving her abusive husband 10 years ago. Sadly, all that would be taken away from her on May 10, 1972, when someone broke into her house, sexually assaulted, and beat her to death. Her 30-year-old son, Ronald, found her body in the living room the next morning. Before she was murdered, she spoke with her housemate, a fellow teacher, around 1 a.m. before heading off to bed. This was the last time she was seen alive. After the murder, the killer took her wallet and discarded it a few blocks away. Investigators determined that the killer had entered the home through an unlocked sliding glass door and then used manicure scissors to cut her clothes off. They were able to collect the killer's fingerprints, but they didn't match anyone in the database. Since nobody in the home, including Ron and his wife, heard the attack, they theorized that she had been knocked unconscious almost immediately using a brick. Unfortunately, with little to no leads, the case would go unsolved for the next 52 years. A few years later, Nellie's murder would be connected to the murder of 48-year-old Teresa Pica. On May 15, 1979, Teresa was found sexually assaulted and murdered 20 minutes from Newark in Hayward, California. Just like Nellie, she was beaten to death. The next morning, one of her 10-year-old twin daughters found her body. Instead of a brick, the attacker used a rock to kill her after entering the home through a front room window that he pried open. Once again, the killer took the victim's wallet and discarded it in a neighbor's yard. Even though they determined the cases were connected, they were still unable to find the killer. In 2021, the Hayward Police Department sent items from evidence to Othram for DNA testing. Using genetic genealogy and follow-up investigative work, the killer was identified as a 73-year-old convicted sex offender, Fred Farnham. Unfortunately, he died in 2007 in Oregon. Farnham had spent time in prison in the 70s for several sexual assaults in Sunnyvale and San Jose. He could be connected to other cases since he moved around quite a bit, living in Nevada, Idaho, North Dakota, Alaska, and Oregon. Unfortunately, Nellie's son, Ronald, who discovered her body, passed away three months before the police solved the case. Sonia Carmen Herrick Stone was born in Quebec, Canada on May 27, 1951. When Sonia was a teenager, she met and fell in love with David Foreman. In 1972, David left Canada for California and Sonia soon followed. Once in California, she wanted to get married and have kids, but David wasn't ready, so they ended the relationship but remained close friends. She then met Michael Stone, and the two quickly fell in love and married. Sonia then gave birth to a daughter named Sasha, and David became the child's godfather. Unfortunately, after the child's birth, Michael lost his high-paying job, and Sonia was suffering from postpartum depression. This began to cause tension in the marriage, and they eventually separated. 
by 1981, 30-year-old Sonia was a single mother living in Carmel by the sea with four-year-old Sasha and working at Levi Strauss. Around this time, she began receiving phone calls from someone who would hang up after she answered. She also felt like she was being watched. On September 15, 1981, while her closest friend, Caroline McBride, was over at her home, they began hearing loud footsteps and someone in the bushes. They called the police, but when they arrived, they found nothing. A month later, on October 15, 1981, Sonia gets up and sends her daughter off to preschool. Her friend Caroline does the same and decides to drop by her house. When she arrived, she saw Sonia's car in the driveway and went up and knocked on the door, but strangely, no one answered. She tried the door and it was unlocked, so she proceeded inside only to have the shock of her life. Sonia was dead on the floor. Worried that the killer was still in the house, she fled the scene and had a neighbor call the police. When investigators arrived, they found Sonia had been sexually assaulted and strangled to death. Investigators noticed that her left ring fingernail was broken and had blood underneath it, which indicated to them that she had scratched her killer. They asked Caroline who she thought might have murdered Sonia, and she pointed at Sonia's husband, Michael Stone. He immediately became the number one suspect, especially since he wasn't being overly cooperative. This was most likely due to the fact that he was very unhappy about the accusations being thrown at him. Since there was no physical evidence tying him to the murder, and he had a very solid alibi, he was removed from the suspect list. However, Sonia's family and friends still felt he was responsible. After moving on from Michael, the detective on the case decided to canvass the neighborhood looking for witnesses and stumbled upon 25-year-old Michael Scott Glazebrook, who lived across the street. When the detective approached him and began asking him questions, he found it strange that Glazebrook was wearing a mask. So the investigator asked him to take it off, and to his surprise, Glazebrook had a three to four inch vertical scratch down his right cheek. Glazebrook explained that he was wearing the mask because he was sanding fiberglass on his boat when the detective approached him. He also explained that the gash on his face was from plexiglass that splintered while he was cutting it. However, when investigators looked at the plexiglass and the work table in the garage, they found no blood at all. They wanted to bring him in for an official interview, but they didn't want to spook him, so they went back to the office and ran a warrant check and discovered he had two traffic warrants. So they arrested him for those and brought him in and began questioning him about Sonya's murder. At that point, he gave investigators a different story. This time, he said that he was in her house on the day of the murder because he and Sonia were having an affair. They also noticed that during the interview, he was really nervous and wasn't giving straight answers. So they asked him to take a polygraph exam and he agreed but failed the test. Unfortunately, all they had at the time was a blood type test and while the blood found under her fingernail matched Glaze Brooks' blood type, it wasn't hardcore proof that he committed the crime. His girlfriend then came forward and said that he told her he was in Sonia's house on the morning of the murder. In July of 1982, he was arrested and charged with first-degree murder. Unfortunately, since he was brought in on traffic warrants but questioned about Sonia's murder, the judge would not allow the interrogation to be presented to the jury. During the trial, which started in November of 1983, Glazebrook's parents took the stand and testified under oath that their son had no scratches on his face on the day of the murder, even though they had photos of him with the scratch at the police station. However, jurors never got to see the photo of him with the scratch because the camera they used to take the photo failed and a photograph was never produced. Then his girlfriend got on the stand and recanted her statement, claiming that detectives force-fed her the information about him being in the house that morning. The trial ended with a hung jury, with only three out of the 12 jurors believing he was guilty. After the mistrial, the district attorney decided not to retry him. For the next 41 years, her family would believe that Sonia's husband, Michael Stone, was responsible, but it was impossible with his alibi. When Sonia's daughter, Sasha, was older, she began asking detectives why her mother's case was not reopened if they were so sure Glazebrook had committed the murder. Finally, in June of 2020, 13 years after Sasha began asking them to reopen the case, all the evidence was re-examined. 
From there, they decided to send some of the items off for DNA testing. The only problem was that the blood vial from Glazebrook had broken while sitting in evidence, so they had to obtain a new sample. Glazebrook was now in his 60s, divorced with an 11-year-old child, and living not far from the crime scene at his parents' home. He was also a coach and umpire for Little League Baseball and drove a school bus. Thankfully, detectives were able to obtain a search warrant for his DNA and pulled him over. Here is an excerpt from that encounter. Mr. Glazebrook, right? Hey, I'm Detective Wilson in the Sheriff's Office. Can you turn your car off? I picked up the case of Sonia Stone, the, the cold case homicide that we've been working forever. And so I have a search warrant for your DNA. Is it time for me to check with my lawyer? No. There's no right to talk to an attorney first. It's the way the search warrant is for. Well, this is your copy. I'm on my way to work, so. Okay. We'll do one side of the cheek and then the other. Okay. So that's it. Um, I'm free to go. But I would like to ask you, who do you think we should be looking at? Who do you think did it? Uh, just from talking to my lawyer and him talking to family members, uh -huh. I know the daughter seems to think her dad did it. Oh, really? I was told during that whole process, and this is kind of what's allowed me to move on from it, is they knew who did it, but they couldn't prosecute him because they already had me set up in the system. So did you even know her at all? No. Okay. Never even met her. I happened to live across the street. And that was it? That was it. But if you guys want to sit down and talk, give me a holler. Okay. I mean, I got to get to work. Gotta... Yeah. While he was pulled over, they asked if he even knew Sonia, and he surprisingly said no, which was completely different from his story all those years ago when he said the two were having an affair. When the DNA results came back, they weren't surprised to find that it matched Glazebrook. He was then arrested in August of 2021 and once again charged with her murder. In honor of Sonia, all the detectives wore Levi's jeans for the arrest. The new trial would go much smoother because of the DNA evidence, and on February 6, 2023, 41 years after Sonia's murder, Glazebrook was convicted of first-degree murder. After the trial, Sonia's brother apologized to Michael Stone for the years of accusations. Michael Scott Glazebrook was allowed to spend the last 41 years free because his parents and girlfriend lied under oath. I can only hope that there are no other victims, but as you know, most murderers don't just kill once. Warren Bruce Barnes was born on May 19, 1951 in Grand Junction, Colorado. He then spent the rest of his life in Grand Junction, but unfortunately, by the age of 69, he found himself homeless. Warren was well known around town and could generally be found sitting in a breezeway near the shop called Monique's Bridal, owned by Monique Lenati, where he would read the books that were donated to him by locals. He read so often, he took on the nickname Reading Man. He was never one to beg and would generally only speak if spoken to. He was so well known around town that when he failed to show up on Monday, March 1st, 2021 to the temp job agency People Ready, where he showed up every day, Monday through Friday asking about jobs, they noticed immediately. He also wasn't in the chair that Monique provided him, so she and Allie Talindi, who worked for Guild Mortgage, decided to track him down. After speaking with managers at People Ready, she called the police and reported him missing. Unbeknownst to the women, the police were already on the case, even if they didn't know it yet. On the night of February 28, 2021, police were called to a stuck vehicle in the water off a boat ramp on the Colorado River. When they arrived, they found 19-year-old Brian Cohey, who said he came and parked at the boat ramp because he needed to get out and wanted somewhere where he could relax and think. As the car was being pulled out of the water, they noticed a lot of red dripping down the back of the car. At first, they thought Kohi was injured, but he said he was fine. Since there was no evidence of a crime, no further investigation was done, at least not yet. The next morning, Kohi's father, Brian Sr., strangely found Warren's wallet in the vehicle. He looked through the wallet and found a card for the People Ready Agency and notified them. They were baffled at why Warren's wallet would have been by a boat ramp on the Colorado River, as he typically never left the confines of the city. Brian Sr. also found a large knife and latex gloves in the glove box. However, it was his mother, Terry, who made the most horrifying discovery. 
As she was going through Kohi's closet, she found a Rubbermaid container with a plastic bag inside covered in maggots. She pulled it out and placed it in the kitchen sink, and to her horror, there was a head inside. In a panic, she called 911. When police arrived, Kohi approached them and confessed to the murder of Warren. He then went on to describe the events that led up to Warren's murder. He said that he was in a bad state of mind for the last few months because he had stopped taking his medication. This caused his thoughts of murder to worsen, and he began searching for his first victim, which took weeks to find. He had one criteria for his victim, someone who wouldn't be missed. So he began looking for a homeless person, and on the night of February 27, 2021, he found Warren Barnes. That night, around 11.30 p.m., he came upon what looked to him like a homeless encampment under a bridge near the sheriff's department. He put on three gloves, pulled off the canvas that was covering Warren, and using the knife his father later found in the glove box, stabbed him to death. He said that Warren's final words were, and I quote, Why are you attacking me? He then went into details that are too gruesome for YouTube, but ended with remains in a container that his mother would later find. He then drew a map for authorities to find the rest of Warren's remains. He was so obsessed with murder that he compared himself to Ed Kemper and said he wore a blue jumpsuit on the night of the murder. He also described the blue jumpsuit as something Michael Myers wore from the movie Halloween and said he even had the Michael Myers mask in his room. He said he threw some of the remains into the river, which is how his car got stuck off the boat ramp. Here's a clip of his interrogation. Because, I mean, Murray going to jail for the 15 years, probably. I have no idea. Because we're at the beginning. It's, it's murder. I mean, I'm going to jail for okay. 20, probably. But um, I figure, well, I fight it on February 27th. It's when they full moon. And I figured, I can see so well why not drive out. And uh, I am in a bad state of mind at that time. I am... I have major depressive disorder, so I am not thinking very positively. Okay. And I'm cruising around for an hour, hour and a half. Um, so I fill up on gas halfway through, and I'm eventually driving underneath the bridge near the sheriff's office. By the way, I'm a habitual like, shaker. I have a question. Mm hmm? You some people who have committed crimes like me. Do we stay in this county jail or are we moved? It all depends on what the judge says. So I grab my knife, I put on three layers of gloves because plastic gloves can betray their users because they're so thin, the final gloves, mm -hmm. by bringing your fingerprints through. So I put on two, three on one hand. I took the knife. He was panicking at first in his old man voice. He was in his 50s. I'm not lying. I know why I call an old man. He was saying, what are you doing? What are you doing? Why? Why? Kohi was then arrested and charged on suspicion of first-degree murder, tampering with evidence, and tampering with a deceased body. He then pleaded not guilty by reason of insanity. Kohi's mother, Terry, said her son was diagnosed with autism, major depressive disorder, and ADHD. She said he always knew he was not like other people and even obtained the nickname Dahmer in middle school. Kohi told his parents that he began hearing whispers at night starting a year before the murder. He also said he felt like he was always being watched, even by the birds and the walls. However, the jury wasn't buying the insanity defense and found him guilty on all charges and sentenced him to life in prison without the possibility of parole. Not once during the trial did Kohi show any remorse, even as local community members got up to speak of Warren's life. To remember Warren, Tim Navin, a metal artist, spent 285 hours creating a memorial for him, which consists of a metal replica of the bamboo chair he would sit in, along with a stack of books with the words, and you also, which is how he would respond to people that said for him to have a good day.